Joining me now on the next film school podcast, uh, one of my favorite returning guests, because he's not only is he kind about the Knicks, but he is humble about his team somehow, even though they just had their most successful season um, in over a decade. And we will talk about that. Um, he is a former pitcher, as we always like to say, for the New York Mets, among a few other teams, but we only care about the Mets. And of course, <laughs> he is a radio host on 105.3 The Fan. Uh, he covers the Rangers and of course he covers the Mavs. Mike Bassett. Hello, sir. How's it going, guys? I am excited, Jonathan. All right, let's talk some NBA because I could talk Mets and their 40 wins and Steve Cohen buying the players. I like it. Francisco Lindor is our favorite player in our household. He's bouncing back. So we can either talk Mets or Mavs or Knicks, whatever you got. I, I'm sure Andrew, who, who is on, on the Zoom here, would love nothing more. Than Listen, just- <laughs> I won't mind at all talking about the Mets for an extended 40 minutes. Unfortunately, Mike, we have to give the listeners what they want. And it's yeah, how you're going to figure out a way from, from your brain, how you're going to figure out a way to get Jalen Brunson in a Knicks uniform for next season. Well, we, we don't want to put that on you, Mike, because no. well, <laughs> before we get to Jalen Brunson, let's just we'll take a step back because we talked, uh, I think it was pre pre trade deadline, probably. Right. Um, and you guys were you guys had started to turn the season around. Um, the Knicks were mired in Nick Um, And then after that, I, I think it was it was either one of the games came after that. We played you guys or the other one. And you, I was looking back at our text and you texted me. And I don't even know if the game was over yet. And you were like. The Knicks are winning the 2022 NBA championship. <laughs> yeah, it was because we all knew that they weren't making the playoffs. At best, maybe they're going to make the play in, but it wasn't going to happen. No. Like, the damn Knicks, like, you know, I mean, the Mavs are fighting for home court advantage in the Western Conference. And then, really, the reason, and I guess it ended up working out okay, I really wanted to get the three seed as the Mavs. Mm-hmm. And then, damn Porzingis, who, you know, I don't like Porzingis. You guys don't like Porzingis. He actually leads the Wizards to a game of beating the Mavs late in the season, which puts the Mavs in the four seed instead of the three seed. But it worked out well for the Mavs. I would I would say so. And we 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 always talk about Porzingis on this pod. We'll keep the tradition going, albeit very briefly. Um, I'll just come out and ask you, did that did that trade save your season? I don't know if saving the season is the right term, but it helped us get to the Western Conference Finals. I think that Porzingis is as soft as they come. And I I, you know, you know what's funny is after the trades all made, all the Mavs people who know the Mavs are like, yeah, Luca hated Porzingis. Yeah. Like he didn't want to play with them anymore. He dropped 29 in the first quarter the night that he got traded oh, because yeah. he didn't like that Porzingis was like, I need to get into a rhythm. I need the ball more. I kind of need my type of, and Luke is like, just play the game and shut up. Like win. how about we just win Porzingis? And he's like, but I need the minutes and I need the ball. And so Luca was so happy that he didn't have to deal with Porzingis being happy if he scored 20 and the Mavs lost. And being unhappy if he scored 10 and the Mavs won. Luca couldn't figure out why won't you play great in great moments? And why is it when we win, you're not satisfied unless we win with you contributing the 20 points that you wanted? Yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever asked you this before. And if I did, and I forgot and I, I apologize, but just, you know, you've been, obviously we've talked about your experience in locker rooms. And I know the NBA is a little different because there's like the star and then having a star player matters. I would argue more, maybe quarterback, right? Is you could argue also, but having an NBA star matters a lot when there's that personality conflict. And I bring this up because you could attribute, you could talk about Donovan Mitchell. You could talk about Trey young. We've heard issues with him and like John Collins and Len, like these things happen. Do you, how big of a deal do you think it is to get, that off of your shoulders. If you're a Luka Doncic and a guy that clearly who's supposed to be your running mate is just not someone to get along with. I think it's huge, especially at an early age, obviously the 30 for 30 on Penny and Shaq, right? I mean, they eventually are like, look, it's my team. No, it's my team. And 
And then uh, Kobe and Shaq run into it. Now they're veterans at that point. Kobe younger, obviously, than Shaq. But I do think it's huge. I, I do think that uh, it takes somebody saying, whether it's verbally or by action, I'll take a lesser role so that we're a better team. Hmm. And Porzingis somehow thinks that he's the better player or as good as Luca. And Luca's kind of like, you got to be kidding me uh, that that this is a conversation. And I'm 21, 22 years old. I'm not deferring to you. And I will say this. I think Jason Kidd and Nico Harrison, and I think led by Jason Kidd, did an yep. unbelievable job to tell Luca to start the season, please, we can't move him. He's yeah. unmovable. You got to give him the ball and you got to get along. You got to give him a five when he makes a, a good decision or when he makes a good play. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, we're not going to be able to move him off of your team. Huh. And so I think that first 30 or 40 games where the Mavs weren't really playing well and there seemed to be like, what the hell's going on? It was Luca being convinced by Kid. Please give them the ball, get along, say positive things about them. If we do that, we have a chance to move them. And it's not like you moved them for great pieces, but you're able to get them off the team. But it's, you know, less is more, right? Sometimes, you know, and, and I was, it's funny. I was looking at Spencer Dinwiddie's numbers after he came to you guys. He went from being literally one of the least efficient play, high volume players in the league to being one of the most. And it's just, and I don't know, I don't want to make this too much about, you know, uh, that, but like, he went from playing with Bradley Beal, who I don't want to say Bradley Beal is like a bad teammate, but there was reportedly some issues there to then playing with Luca. And like, you know, they're like two peas in a pot all of a sudden. Yeah, I'll say this. I'll leave it at this. Maxi Kleba gets interviewed after one of the first games that Dinwiddie and Bertans are on the team and Porzingis is off the team. Mm -hmm. And Maxi Kleba, without taking a shot at Porzingis, takes a shot at Porzingis by saying, it feels like these guys have been here for a long time and they want to be here. And yes. all he's saying, we got two guys who want to be here. Yep. Meaning we got rid of the guy who didn't want to be here. And poor Zingas, his first interview was with Washington. Hey, I'm ecstatic. Who's yeah. ecstatic to go to a crap <laughs> team that is a team fighting for home court advantage? And sometimes you say, hey, it was a tough decision. It's yeah, yeah. right. And you just say, I'm excited to be part of this new team. But I mean, he was literally like his first emotion was I was ecstatic. He was happy to be off of the mask. Porzingis is never going to be happy. With, I mean, I think you guys know that. Oh, we, now. He's we knew it. Yeah, we, it, it was never a question about that. It, for us, I think it was a question of like, for me personally, it was a question of would the talent outweigh the personality issues? And that's I think what we've, you know, unfortunately for him, have come to realize with the injuries, it's, you know, he's yeah. never going to be the same player. Enough about Porzingis. against. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you guys ended up having um, a run to the Western Finals, which I, I, I don't know if I actually texted you this. Andrew, as my witness, uh, I was picking the, the Mavs left and right, picked them against the Jazz. I actually, no, I did text you that. I except I predicted they would be down. Uh, two games to one against Utah without Luca, and then Luca would come back. And I think I said they would win in like six or seven. And I picked them against the Suns, and I, I did pick them against the Warriors. And you know, to my <laughs> you to my detriment. Funny is Luca's injury scared me so much. I said, look, I, I think that this team could make it far, but I just don't see how they're going to do it without Luca. And when Luca comes back, there's just no way he's going to come back like Luca. And Derek Harper's our TV analyst. Yep on the Dallas Mavericks. And I know we a lot love of Derek. fans like him, right? And so Derek's like, do you know when you have an injury and you're coming back from an injury, even the really good players, like Derek Harper, a good, solid player in the Very NBA, good. it takes us like two to four games to maybe get back to where we were. And this guy, Luca, who just turned 23, is able to come back pretty much in the first game of sitting out two and a half weeks in a playoff game and be like, yeah, here I am, guys. I'm back to Luca. You know, mm -hmm. it is is pretty amazing. And look, I don't want to, you know, go Luca's perfect. He he needs to but, mature and get better, but he's pretty stinking awesome at his uh, you know, age right now. I I don't want to get Andrew started, so I won't tell you some of the 
some of the names that I brought up in in uh, in combination with Luka Doncic on some you don't, you don't Patreon episodes. Say, you don't have to say all of the names, but specifically tell Mike one of the names that you say. Say first with. name is you, uh, Mike. Yeah, I, 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 to me, watching Doncic in these playoffs, I'm not. And Andrew got mad at me because it's like I skip past LeBron. I'm like, look, I'm not skipping past LeBron. But the the for me, it, it was about. The 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 I'm the best player in the building. I know I'm the best player in the building. They know I'm the best player in the building. I know they know I'm the best player in the building and I'm going to go out and do it anyway. And that's what to me he did against the Suns and in the way where it's like, I don't have any weaknesses in my game and I'm just going to go out here and dominate. And he did that. And we could talk about why things fell short against Golden State, but like I'm, I'm sorry, I, I brought, I said Jordan's name, you know, in the same sentence. I, I have to, I get criticism for that in Dallas, right? And, and like, hey, hold on, and I get it, right? I mean, there's he has to to think to do the things that I think he can do. He hasn't done them yet, and it's interesting. I'm reading a lot uh, after watching that Winning Time show on HBO. Yeah. I'm like look, I got to actually read the real book. And, you know, they stretch the truth quite a bit on that show. Just a little. <laughs> and now I'm reading the book. After reading that book, I'm also reading the book, which is about 10 years old from Jackie McMullen, When the Game Was Ours, mm-hmm. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird. This is when I fell in love with the game in the 80s when the Lakers and Celtics were dominating the NBA and there's a young Michael Jordan. And there's all these moments when you start reading about these guys, there's these moments of – maturity for all of them. Magic Johnson, after losing in 84 and and somewhat accidentally dribbling the clock out, like all of a sudden, a lot of his kind of maturity issues were like, okay, I'm going to take this game so seriously that you're never going to question. I'll still put on the smile. I'll still do the interviews, but this game means more to me than anything. And, And there's these moments in all of these players' lives that there's this crossroad of, yes, you're great. Do you want to be the greatest? And for Jordan, it was getting beat by the Pistons. We know it from all the, you know, interviews and everything. It's like, all right, I'm going to change my body. I'm going to change the way I see this game. Phil Jackson is helping me see it this way. I agree with some things, disagree with some things. Like there's these crossroads for every player in their career to take it to the level of, are you the greatest player of your era? Can you be considered a great player of all time? And Luca hasn't got to that crossroad yet. And I wonder what it's going to be for him where he goes, I'm going to take this game as seriously as possible, be in the greatest shape that you can be in coming to camp and dominate this league. I'm sure. I mean, you've seen the workout videos. Let me look. It's a couple little clips, but for a guy that admitted, I actually, I don't know. Did he admit coming into camp like grossly out of shape? Because he did on JJ Reddick's podcast. Okay. So, you know, uh, look, that's a scary thought for the league, which is a good transition to talking about Brunson. So uh, Jordan obviously had Pippen, um, Magic had Kareem and then Worthy, you know, a couple of pretty good players. Uh, Larry Bird, a couple of Hall of Famers, like every one of these, you know, LeBron's the only one. And then he left to go find it in Dwayne Wade and then to, with Kyrie Irving, like all of the guys I just mentioned, with the exception of Irving, who probably maybe has like top 75 all time talent, uh, but above the neck and like some of the other things. We, again, we don't have to talk about that. Um, but like all these guys found a top 75 player or players to help them along the way. You mentioned Shaq. Shaq played with Kobe. Kobe played with Shaq. You know, it's it, right. it, Jalen Brunson is not that like I, I, I and we're I, I'm a I admitted, I've told you, I'll say it again. I hope the Knicks figure out a way to get him because he's a really good basketball player. I think he can make an all-star team in this league someday. I really do. Do how do you think that that plays a role at all in terms of what the Mavs, how they're approaching the Brunson situation? Or do you just think from their perspective, it's like, look, we can't let this guy go. We're going to do whatever it takes to keep him. I've heard multiple things from multiple different people, which is it's interesting because they do contradict. It's not a consensus because I have heard from some people. um, I won't say as connected to the Mavericks, but connected in the NBA that say, Hey, the Mavs kind of understand that Brunson probably can't be your second best player and you win a championship or become a, a go on kind of championship runs for let's say the next five years, you're kind of in the finals, two out of the five years in the conference finals, another time type of deal. They, they think that Brunson is a great third player on a championship team that you can, you got to find somebody better than him, but 
He can be somewhat, maybe your Derek Fisher would be an example of, I know he's a lefty guy that like <laughs> Derek Fisher was considered a point guard, but didn't really in Phil Jackson's system. Was there a true point, you know, type of deal? It was kind of, you had multiple guys that could play that role for you in different situations. And so I've also heard from Dallas Maverick people, they're not letting Jalen Brunson go. They're going to give him the fifth year, which is going to somewhat trump what any other team can give. And they're going to make sure that Jalen Brunson, if he leaves, he's leaving for less money and I guess a better opportunity, but he would be leaving money on the table that they won't get beat by somebody saying, Hey, we're going to give you, let's say four years and a hundred million. And that's the, the that's say, the number. And right. let's just say the Mavs go, we're not going to give you but 21 million a year. So take it or leave it. Like I've heard that the Mavs are willing to, in this situation, we'll go to the 25 mil a year and we'll give the fifth year to make sure that it, it is, you know, like let's say the Knicks go four for a hundred that I've heard the Mavs will say, well, then we'll do five for 120 or we'll do five for 125. We we're, we're matching the offer and giving the extra year. And like the, so we just did a whole well, a four part podcast on, on Jalen Brunson, because again, like I, I, to, again, to be completely transparent about this, like he is, well, well I shouldn't say that they, there there's rumors. They may try to trade up in the draft for, for Jaden Ivey, but assuming they can't make that move in the draft, he's the next off season. Because if they don't figure out a way to get him, then it's, oh, are we trading for Malcolm Brogdon? Or are we, you know, trying to kick the tires on someone we can get in our mid-level yeah. exception? Are we taking, you know, trying to get D- D'Angelo Russell on the cheap for me? Like these very uninspiring yeah. options. And again, for whatever faults Brunson may have, and we could talk about it a little bit, like he's unequivocally their first choice. So I, I, I putting that out there, like John Collins just got five for one twenty five. He's the name that I just brought up um, on this episode because he's he's a good player, right? Puts up 20, 20 a night. He can shoot the three. You know, not the best defender. Doesn't really create for you, but like he's he's a decent player. Brunson is a more valuable player in the league today than John Collins. I would argue. I, well, he's, he's definitely healthier and more reliable. Yeah, absolutely. I think because John Collins, I think, has tremendous talent, but. If you can't be on the court, but let's say 70% of a regular season, and then you're 70% available in the playoffs, and you seem to really fluctuate um, in in your contributing to a playoff win, uh, I would rank Brunson um, above him. I get that you could say Collins has more talent, but Brunson is uh, right now a better NBA basketball player. If that makes sense. And isn't isn't that... The, the the aura of Jalen Brunson, right? He has always outkicked the coverage on his own talent. And that's what makes him special. And that's what makes him, for me, a guy that like, yeah, okay, we can talk about it. He's not an ideal second option or whatever. You know he's going to work. And he's going to keep working and working and working. And that's what I love about him. So, like, if I'm... You can know, I throw this out here real quick? Please, yeah. Have you guys heard uh, Jalen Brunson's interview? It might have been with Tim McMahon of ESPN about playing with Luca. Uh, his interview with Tim Mc. When is that? When was that from? I may have I, missed I believe, it. I believe it was either near the end of the playoffs or after the playoffs for the Mavericks. So it's been in the last three weeks. But he did say, "I've kind of understood how to play with Luca, and and that and it's almost like I in, I kind of enjoy playing with Luca because I've now understood how to play with Luca. And then when Luca goes off the court, on how. I control the game. Now, I don't know if that means that he's committed to being a Dallas Maverick and excited about being a Dallas Maverick. I would be lying to you. I've interviewed Jalen Brunson, uh, but I don't know the way he's leaning in where he wants to go in this offseason. But I thought it was interesting that he said, look, if you want rhythm and you want flow, Luca's kind of not the right guy to play with because he's going to dominate the ball and he's going to find you. But if you want to kind of dance with the ball or you want the ball to be touched equally between these three or four guys, it's not going to happen. And I've learned how to play off of Luca. And he's played off of him really well. I would say the only the only thing that he could be a little bit better at, and this is I, a fear of some Nick fans in terms of like if he was here, he's not a guy who wants to stand out there on the three point line and just spot up and fire away threes. And that's not what he wants to do. He wants to 
operate inside the arc and like do all of his little moves. And like, as, and that's of what now, as of now, he's a below average three point shooter for his position. He's not a bad three point. No, shooter. he's the numbers are good on, but it's on lower volume. I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but I, I, I agree. I think he's a great fit with Luca. I, where I was going with the money thing is like, especially after the reporting came out about how, you know, he would have taken the, the, the extension for whatever it was four for 55 yeah. and Matt and Dallas, like I, you know, again, you're, you're an athlete. This stuff doesn't it get personal sometimes. If you're Brunson, if you're CAA, might you go in there and be like, you know what? Uh, Give us what's give give us your best number right now and like see how high they they get. I I do think in Brunson and his father, I guess you know his father is a very confident man too, and now he's you know with the New York Knicks is he's pretty much said in an interview with Derek Harper during the playoffs. It might have been recorded before the playoffs, but I saw it during the playoffs in the Utah Jazz series when he had the forty plus points in Game yep. Two and and was having a great series through the first three games, leading a team without Luca. And his dad was kind of like, "Well, I thought he should have been starting all along," you know, type of deal. And it took the Tim Hardaway injury kind of to really push him into you're going to be the starter the rest of the season. But you could hear. Uh, Jalen's father kind of talking about um, his confidence in his son and then the confidence that he's always had. And then it's kind of like finally the Mavs gave him a role where he could um, average his 16 to 18 points and and be more of a um, option uh, rather than a supplemental player. I will say this. I'm not trying to defend the Mavs. I'm not. I love the Mavs. They're my team. They've made mistakes throughout this building around Luka process, and they've made some good decisions too, is that last year after the playoffs where the Clippers shut down Brunson and he was not even really a weapon, they pretty much put Nicholas Batum on him or at times uh, Paul George, and it was like, he can't do anything. He's not. Now, that was where we were like, dang it. Like, I like Brunson, but is he just like a nice reserve off the bench? And then in the playoffs, if you concentrate on him, you can kind of shut him down. And he proved in this playoff run, yeah. he can figure out a way to get his somewhere between 15 to 20 points and be an effective player on a playoff, you know, in a playoff run. Well, um, I'll tell you one thing, uh, him starting games, him dominant, getting on ball possessions, him uh, getting a high usage rate, getting a lot, a lot of shot opportunities. That will not be an issue playing for Tom Thibodeau and the New York Knicks. If, it, as you said, we don't know what he wants. My hope, I mean, you know, people make it about Leon Rose. People will now make it about Rick Brunson, the connection, you know, even Tibbs, because Rick has coached with Tibbs, you know, at multiple stops. Like, that's not why he's come. I mean, maybe that helps. Right. But like, do you, I don't think that's why he's going to come here. I think he's, he would come here because he has a vision for his career that maybe is different than, you know, being Luca's wingman. Now he's his wingman. Maybe down the road, it, it becomes yeah. third in the pecking order, you know, and that's this. And who's to say they don't trade Jalen if Jalen gets them the main guy. So that's the only thing I'm coming at this with. And I'll say this, uh, being a a son of a dad who played major league baseball. I don't know if people know that or not about me, but my dad, tell the the story for anybody who doesn't know. So my dad played for the Texas Rangers and Minnesota twins. So my dad knows me the best, my dad, father first. And now as an adult, you know, my best friend. And he's, if I had the opportunity the way Jalen Brunson does and the way that it looks like Jalen's relationship with his father, Rick, that they have somewhat of yes, father, son, but also my best coach, the person who understands me the most, the the person that I trust the most. and, And he trusts me is that would be a tough thing to pass up in my life. If I was ever as good as Jalen Brunson was, don't sell yourself I, short on here. You're not going to sell yourself short on here, but okay. come on. But if I had the opportunity to be on my father's pitching staff, that he okay. was the pitching coach of, let's just say the New York Mets. I'll say like, I'm with the Texas Rangers and I have put myself in a position that I can now pitch anywhere I want to. And everybody wants me and the opportunities there financially is the okay. same. But then I also have my father as the pitching coach. I would go to that team. I, me personally, if, if that was, 
if I was choosing between, and the Texas Rangers is not a good example for me because I grew up here. So, okay. you know, I have to put it like the Arizona Diamondbacks. Like, hey, I'm in Phoenix. I, I enjoy it. I like it. But that's not home. It's not where I grew up. And then I have a place where now my father is the pitching coach. And he's not the manager, but he's the pitching coach. And I know he has a lot of say. And I can go pitch for him. And he knows me. He knows, he knows my negatives. He knows my positives. He knows me mentally. He knows me physically. He, that would be tough to pass up. I wouldn't pass that up if I got that opportunity. So I don't know if probably Rick Brunson wasn't hired just to go get Jalen, but there's probably a part of it where they're like, if it helps us great is that I wouldn't pass that up if I was Jalen Brunson and it seems like he has a similar relationship without knowing him, his father, or knowing Jalen at all besides interviewing him. It seems like they have a very close relationship, a very trusting father-son, also coach relationship. So I could see where Jalen would want to get to the New York Knicks if financially they can also give him 20 plus million a year. So that'll get us to, to the last last topic for today, which is um so I, I'm, again, we've talked a little bit about this offline, but you know, th- there are two roads the Knicks can go here, right? They can pay other teams to take on their salaries and try to open up the cap space that it would it would cost to sign him outright, or they can bluff on, in that respect and then go to Dallas. And again, this is all this all supposes Jalen Brunson has and has met with Leon Rose and says, "I want to let's do this." Okay, um, and and then it's do you do can you do a sign and trade? You're, I know you're, you may not admit it. I know you're connected with the Mavs and I know you know how they think. If if Jalen Brunson meets with the Knicks and decides, I want to be a New York Knick, how do you think the Mavs would respond to that? Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there. Yeah, yeah. Assuming the Knicks are willing to come and say, look, we're, we're going to make this you know, worth your while. We're going to give you, you're going to end up with some, whether it's Derek Rose or maybe you do a three team. I was thinking, I was thinking all kinds of things today. Like, can you do a three team with uh, Malcolm Brogdon ending up on Dallas? Like maybe, you, maybe the Mavs get their pick back the 2023 first that we currently have something, you know, that's it, you're, you're not get, getting left empty handed. Yeah. Do you think, what do you, how do you think they'd react? I would say that Mark Cuban would try to talk Jalen into staying here. Okay. But let's just say through your, okay, that's the first thing, but it doesn't work. Jalen says, look, I've made up my mind. I want to be a New York Nick. And I know that they can get me on that team for the money that I want, but through agents and through everything, Hey, we can work out also a deal that could benefit the Mavs. Yeah. I think the Mavs and Nico Harrison, I, I do really like Nico Harrison. I think that was a very good hire. He's done a nice job so far. And so I think that they would try to work something out. Now, talking to you, I'll tell your listeners, if you want to follow somebody on Twitter who's pretty good with cap stuff and does do some Maverick stuff, and maybe could, you know, Jalen Brunson stuff, there's a guy called David Lord, who okay. uh, I'm not telling you, look, he has his own political beliefs on his um, social media too. I'm not t- saying to follow because I believe in the same political beliefs that he believes in, but he's very good with the cap. He uh, does a lot of stuff through Dallas Maverick stuff. And maybe if you want to follow him this off season to kind of figure out where the Jalen Brunson stuff could be leading. If this possibility happens. Good to know. I've heard from one of my friends who's an agent that Mitchell Robinson would like to be a Dallas Maverick. He sees that as a, I'm not saying saying he doesn't want to be a Nick, but he also does see that the Knicks are kind of loaded at that position and doesn't see his, value in New York. I'll I'm say. not sure he wants to be a Nick anymore. Honestly, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to give away everything Mitchell Robinson has going for him or not has going for him, but he does see if a guy like Dwight Powell can average 10 points a game, what could he average being in that role as a Dallas Maverick? And I didn't know this, but I guess he has lived in Dallas in some off season or something. Um, or I, I'm in Dallas. You might know more about like your Knicks players and no, doing in the off season. So. Maybe I, I know him as a, as just a Louisiana guy. And I, we okay. always see the videos of him going home to Louisiana in the off season. I, that said, maybe he does. I, I'll say this. I've heard the Dallas, the Dallas thing has been out there since the end of his rookie year. Okay. And I, I could say that with a hundred percent confidence that they, there, that there's been something there okay. in terms, I don't know whether that was Mitch. I don't know if that was his agent at the time pushing that. I don't know okay. if it was the Mavs pushing that, but 
I've heard that for three years. Believe me, I don't have all the answers on all this. I've talked to you. You're smarter at sign in trades and all the base year compensations. And so is this guy, David Lord, who I'm promoting. So I ask you guys these questions and get more information and more knowledge on it. It seems like it would be very hard it's, to, to put Mitchell Robinson in a trade for Jalen Brunson because it would. Of the sign in trade versus sign in trade situation. Yeah, it, it would be hard um, in the same deal. Uh, you, there's always, you know, the NBA where, you know, chicanery always is, is a foot. You could maybe you do it as two separate transactions. I will say, though, it would I think it would be the first time in. Well, it wouldn't be the first sign of double sign of trade in league history. Uh, D'Angelo Russell and Kevin Durant, uh, yeah. something. But that was not a base year compensation because of the base year compensation issue. It would make it virtually impossible. Um, you know, I don't know Would that. How how much would that factor in? It's we just don't know. I mean, at the same time, though, the doubt the Mavs um, like I'm sure there would be a way for them if that if Mitch wanted to go there. But again, it's like, do, yeah. what what did the Knicks agree to look the other way if they do the sign and trade? With, it's, you know, and, I don't know. And then also this, this gets into minutia, but I think it's very important even for Knicks fans if they're trying to get Jalen Brunson. Um, from what I understand if Jalen Brunson does sign with the Dallas Mavericks, and I know that'd be disappointing to Knicks fans. The Mavs can't do any sign in trades with other free agents. They've gone over a threshold of $165 million. Yes. That, like, cause people here, you know, say, what about Mo Bamba? What about Mitchell Robinson? The Mavs obviously desperately need a center. And it's like, no, you can't get any of those guys. If Jalen Brunson does come back to Dallas, it's impossible. Those are hard capped. Allow yeah. it. Uh, for that, you'll have to go get a center off of a team that's already under contract. But there's a whole bunch there that I think Jalen Brunson's going to be a Dallas Maverick. But I have heard also Orlando really likes Jalen Brunson because Mosley, who was an assistant coach for Rick Carlisle, really loved Jalen Brunson and thinks that maybe he could help his really young team. And Jalen Brunson's a younger guy, but a great, right? Mental guy, leadership guy, has been in the league now for four years that he could help whether they get Jabari Smith along with some of their younger guys that they have, that they do have the cap space to just offer. They, I think they can offer up to 27 million per year if Orlando wanted to go all in on trying to get Jalen Brunson. So that could be an option where the Mavs lose out, the Knicks lose out and Jalen Brunson sees, I like this coach. He used to be my coach. And I am now leading a team over in Orlando. And because of the money that they gave me, they're not going to be like, hey, Jalen Suggs or Cole Anthony, you guys are running point. This is now Jalen Brunson's team and you're going to have to fit in where you get in or they move those guys off the team. And unless I'm grossly misunderstanding the situation, which is always possible, um, the more competitors there are for Jalen Brunson and his services, I think the better that is for the Knicks because then if the Dallas Mavericks if he again, if Brunson would rather go to the Knicks and the Mavs are not willing to play ball initially, Brunson could just say, well, I can go over here and I can just get my money and then you get nothing or, you know, unless you right. work out a, a right. something where it's a trade exception, at least with the Knicks, you know, again, like I don't know that uh, Derek Rose is exciting anybody over in Dallas or, or like in every 48. I'll be honest. I don't know about Nico and, and Cuban. G D Derek Rose has, has been a better player for the New York Knicks than I ever thought he would be coming from Minnesota, but I would not be excited at all about Derek Rose. I do. His injury history would scare me. His age would scare me. Yeah. That being said, I think what's scaring Mark Cuban, I hope the most is I know his new five-year Supermax extension starts this upcoming season. But if we just let Jalen Brunson go and we don't fight for him or we don't get something good back, we're going to lose Luca in two to three years. He's going to say, I'm not signing any more contracts with the Dallas Mavericks. And Bill Duffy's his agent. Bill Duffy and Mark Cuban for over a decade hated each other because of the Steve Nash situation. So I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but Duffy and Mark Cuban were mortal enemies for a long time until the Luca draft happened. And it's almost like they've agreed to get along because – of the fit in Dallas. And I don't know Duffy and Cuban's relationship now. I'm sure it's way better than it was, but I mean, they hated each other for a long time because of the Steve Nash situation.
Bill Duffy, also the agent for uh, today's, as we're recording this, today's birthday boy, RJ Barrett. Um, yeah, there you go. So You know, you guys are in an interesting situation, just being a, a onlooker of the New York Knicks. And I want them to do well. Unfortunately, right here, my Dallas guy, Julius Randle, I think turned off a lot of Knicks fans, even though I, I was like, going to go the whole episode without bringing up his name. And I, you felt brought like it up, and now it. I felt like what he did to the New York Knicks fans is very New York Knicks fandom of him. It's like he fit in just perfectly with New York Knicks fans. But that obviously they see it differently. He did not have a, a year that, he, he, you know, the Knicks fans are proud of that he should be proud of. Um, that being said, I do think he can bounce back. I wonder if it's with the Knicks, but you guys are in a unique situation that you guys have good role players and most of them are young with a lot of, it, they can't improve. Right. But it's, you guys need the guy and, and I don't know how you guys get the guy. Maybe there is a guy out there. And me personally, I understand why you want Jalen Brunson. I just don't think he takes you to the place you want to be. You still need the next guy. And, can you guys, whether it's R.J. Barrett along with Obi Toppin, along with like, how do you package two or three of these nice young players that I don't know if they're ever going to step into the role of Ja Morant, Jason Tatum, Luka Doncic, you know what I'm saying? How do you trade two or three of those guys to get the guy to start leading your organization? Well, you you saw up close and personal uh, the guy that I think the Knicks would like to lead their organization when you uh, yeah, you came to game one, man, you guys were recruiting Brunson hard there in Dallas. I, well, playoffs. so again, you, you texted me the day. You're like, are they here for Brunson? I, and my, my gut reaction when Wes showed up to the game was they're there for Mitchell. And that's the guy that's, I mean, you, you know, and everybody around the league knows that that's the guy the Knicks want. Um, I actually think it's better for them that, it doesn't seem like Utah is going to deal him this off season because I don't think the Knicks are in a spot yet where that trade makes complete sense for them. I think a year from now, it could make more sense. And how does Brunson play into that? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that Brunson and Mitchell would be like a, a pairing, you know, does Brunson go off in that trade again? We're getting ahead of ourselves, uh, ourselves here. That's the guy that they want though, you know, and Okay. That's why I think this is such an important season for them because we always we always talk about the perception of the New York Knicks around the league. What is their perception? How are people viewing them? Do people think it's a dumpster fire? Do people think it's a disaster? It's in some place people want to go play. Um, that's why the Randall thing this year, for me at least, was such a was such a bummer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you guys did. So, you had such a great regular season. I thought you guys could beat Atlanta. It didn't come close to happening. And then it just went back to, I mean, I'm not trying to rag on you guys. I want you guys to be good. I like lefty, right? Julius Randle from Dallas, lefty. RJ Barrett, lefty. Um, is just It just went in such a direction that I feel like you're almost directionless right now and, it, need, yeah. and need a player to kind of get you back on the path of we're going to make the playoffs. Now, how much damage can we do in the playoffs? And I feel for you. I kind of root for the Knicks. Um, but and especially now that you guys don't hate us as much because we don't have poor Zingas <laughs> on our team. I was, so. I was rooting for you guys in the playoffs. I'll, I, I admitted that. L last thing before I let you go on actually on Randall since we since he came up. Um, and I think we we've touched on this before, but I'll, I'll I found out I, the maps have no interest in Julius Randall. I, oh, I want them to have interest. They don't have, I wasn't even going to ask you that. Cause I know the answer. That's I wasn't going to bring it up. Um, if a guy's had a season like Randall just had where it is it's evident to me, at least there was off the court stuff that, you know, you know, we don't, who knows, who knows what it is, but you know, he, he, something was not right with him. Um, have you been, in a situation where you, you had a teammate or whatever that was going through some stuff. And like, as, as a teammate of that player, how much confidence do you have that like that person's maybe going to figure their stuff out in the off season or, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, that's a good question. I'll go to my New York Mets days. And there were uh, a couple things I was traded with Roberto Alomar. Obviously, he was the part of the trade that was supposed to get the Mets back to the World Series or back into the playoffs. He just didn't want to be in New York. Now, I don't know how public that was, you know, because I wasn't reading all the papers back then, even though I remember John Franco taking the papers and throwing them and, you know, getting really mad at Bobby Valentine for talking in the papers too much, which was always a 
as an interesting part of my life. I was like, oh man, the players do have more power than the manager does. That's interesting. But so that was one there. And then the other one was in the media, I think different than Julius Randle, but one I can, if you guys ever remember Grant Roberts, he was kind of a prospect for you guys with the Mets. And Andrew then, remembers him. <laughs> and then it was, I can't remember if it was August or September, but the back page of one of the papers was the Mets have gone to pot because there was a picture of him smoking oh, yeah. weed. Stems. They call them the stems. Yeah. Yes. And I think it was in double A where the picture was because the girl yeah. kind of, um, you know, tried to blackmail him and he didn't give money. So she did give the report to the paper and they ran it. And it was tough. All of that going on, us not playing well. Uh, Bobby not really having the clubhouse, the clubhouse kind of turning a little bit on him. The veteran guys, Roberto Alomar, a major piece, didn't want to be there. Mo Vaughn didn't want to be there because I can remember, you know, I like telling these stories to Mets fans. If there are Mets fans listening that are also Knicks fans, I remember being in the dugout around the trade deadline. So near the end of July and Mo Vaughn, I'm going to, is it okay if I cuss on? Yes. Please. Okay. So Mo Vaughn, putting his bats in the back rack, getting ready for the game. And he had recently done an interview either the day before or the day of that. There was a rumor that he could be going back to the Red Sox in a possible trade. And he kind of said, well, that would be great. I'd love to play for the Red Sox again. Kind of a, a nice answer, but also like a, maybe I don't want to be here anymore. And Bobby V was near the bat rack. I think I was the only dude in the dugout and he goes, Hey, Mo, you got me into this shit and you're going to get me out of it. You ain't going anywhere. And it was just, it wasn't a good environment at all. Right. I mean, Robbie doesn't want to be there. Mo doesn't want to be there. We got the, the Mets gone to pot thing. So the media is on us with that. And, you know, I think now if somebody saw a guy, you know, smoking pot in double A, it would be a big deal. Like who cares article, yeah. but in 2002, it was a huge article. So yeah. all of that caused us to pretty much, I won't say me, but as a team, right? Us as a team, we just weren't into it. And in 2003, Bobby Valentine's gone. Our how comes in. Then they get rid of, like Steve Phillips won the battle between him and Bobby. Then Steve Phillips is gone. It just, then they had to rebuild. And luckily they did it with um, Wright and Reyes on the left yep. side and did a great job of quickly rebuilding. But I mean, that whole thing, Jonathan, that led to, that whole team had to be pretty much redone. Okay. And I don't think it's that bad with the Knicks, but I'm also not in the Knicks locker room. Yeah. I'm not part of the Knicks. I don't know how bad it got last year where maybe there just has to be kind of a redo where even the young guys, even people like me were kind of like, this is a toxic environment. Cause if you think about it, Oh, two, Oh three, we had some young guys, but Ty Wigginton, Aaron yeah. Heilman stuck around, but like a lot of kind of younger guys is almost like we had to leave too, because we were shocked by how bad the environment was. And it was newer guys like Wright and Reyes. And I can't remember all the prospects. I know Lasting's Millage wasn't a big prospect, but didn't work out. But like he was a big deal. I remember Lasting's Millage. He was a big name. You kind of had to get rid of almost the whole thing to redo it. So there wasn't that toxic, toxic environment in the building. Well, you you just verbalized why I from afar, having not been in the locker room, am concerned about. Julius Randle remaining on the team because I, for one, believe that the young core here is still very, we want to be here. We like being Knicks. Um, yeah. I think there's a genuine excitement with RJ, with OB, with quickly, with, you know, even like uh, our rookies, Quentin Grimes had a nice little year. Um, you know, that's my, that's my fear. But uh, I, again, I will not, I think I'm running out of teams on, on who to pawn Julius Randle off on. I had a Blazers guy on here last week. I had a Kings guy on here. And now you're saying you don't want, I don't know. I would take them. I'm not running the Mavericks though. The people who are running the Mavericks through not, it's not like Mark Cuban directly told me this or Jason Kidd, but through people that I trust mm -hmm. have pretty much said, I've kind of brought up Julius Randle because I do think he could be a nice piece to the Mavs and redo his game and get back to being a guy who could be close to 20, 10 rebounds, which the Mavs desperately need. And a guy that doesn't need the ball to be successful. What I mean by that is he handles the ball way too much for you guys. He's not that mm -hmm. good. He's good, but he needs to handle the ball way less. And I think he would accept that role here in Dallas, but the Mavs don't believe I could be wrong. Watch, watch on June 23rd, the Mavs make a trade for Julius Randall. But from what I've heard, it ain't happening. 
I, I, you know what? If he, if the shooting didn't drop off so precipitously, and if his great shooting year wasn't um, preceded by several years in which he didn't shoot it that well, I would say maybe different story. Because like if you if you're building a team around Luca, I think it, the first, it has to start with shooting. And then I know I I know I hang out here too long. I have a few Knicks questions. Percentage that they trade up to number four to get Jaden Ivy. I do really like him. I I I'm all I don't say I'm all in on Jaden Ivy, but like. Because to, here, just very briefly, my philosophy on Ivy, just so you know, is yes, there are significant questions, very real questions about his game. Guess what? If any of those questions weren't there, he'd be the first pick in the draft. You don't get guys like that. And whoever had have an opportunity to trade or draft him wouldn't be trading the pick. They'd be picking him because you can't create that. It's like that. So for me, um, I'd love it, but I don't know, 10%. All right. They stick at 11, right? Nick's at the 11th pick. Yep. What's your dream scenario at 11? Who falls to 11? Realistic? Yeah, because re- obviously Jaden Ivey's not falling to 11. No. So realistic. Besides, I guess the first five guys are pretty locked in. I'm not saying they're going one, two, three, four, five exactly, but the yeah. first five guys in the draft aren't going to be there at 11 that we see in mock. So who would you hope falls there that you think could be a guy? I don't think it's realistic because I think he's going to go in the first eight picks. Maybe that's even short selling him, but I, I like Dyson Daniels a lot with the full acknowledgement that I think Dyson Daniels on a really good team. It's, it's a lot like we were talking about Jalen, a uh, different player than Jalen Brunson to be extraordinarily clear. But like, I think there's a world where that guy is going to be a third best player on a really, really, really good team for yeah. a long time. If he doesn't fall, um, I like Matherin. And again, I don't think Matherin's a star, but like, you know, give me movement shooting, give me toughness, give me a guy who rebounds from the guard position, give yeah. me a guy who could do some stuff off ball, which is not something the Knicks do at all right now, but it doesn't mean they will yeah. always not do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you those two names. I got, I mean, Hey, thank you. This was fun. I'm hoping the Knicks get the right trade that they get the superstar guy that they need. Who do you want to see? Who's the super? Who, Come on, I'll, I'll ask you one final question. Who's the superstar that, that the Knicks wind up getting? If he's available, I do think Donovan Mitchell in the right situation uh, can lead a team. Um, I think that he's growing. I don't know this. I think he's growing tired of the Utah Jazz situation. Is he As, trying to hide it? I don't know. As Derek Harper said when he was a Dallas Maverick and there was rumors that he was getting traded to Utah, he told the Dallas media, you go to Utah. <laughs> so, And then he got traded to the Knicks. So he obviously did not want to be a Utah Jazz uh, at that moment in his career. But I think, you know, realistically, right, I think, you know, a guy who I think could have really worked out for you well, and I don't know if he's superstar status, but he's definitely all-star status. I thought Sabonis could have been a nice pickup for you guys if you could have figured out how to do that at that moment. I'm a big fan of Sabonis. I think he'd bring... He didn't help out Sacramento much. No, he didn't. Well, I don't know. I think they have their own set of issues, which, you know, well, look, we'll see what happens. I mean, they have the fourth pick. I, I think he brings some of the same questions, not all the same questions, some of the same questions as Julius Randle in that he's a, a big guy who is not going to be a threat from the outside. He brings some defensive issues if he's, you know, and you got to play him at the five. So I like him as a player. I'm curious to see how the fit is there. I'm curious to see what they, what they do. If one of the, if one of the top three guys falls, like I know, again, we had a Kings guy on here would love Chet um, Holmgren to, to fall. I call him the skeleton in skin. That's my nickname for him. Man, what is he? 175, 180, 190, whatever it is. It's not, I will be wrong. If he works out as a star player, I'll be wrong. I think he'll have a role in the NBA for a long time. If that you're not being a star, I will, I will say I was wrong. I've seen Sean Bradley at that weight try to play in the NBA or similar to that. I've seen guys that weak physically, and it doesn't work out well. And I know that Durant is not that skinny, but man, he was more wiry with his ability at UT than um, Gonzaga Chet is. Yeah, I don't. Is there a guy you love from this draft? I, I know I keep saying last question. This, this is the last one. Is yeah, there a guy? I, I, I love doing this. Um, I see, I see the potential greatness in Jabari Smith and I really do like Paulo. I, I really do. Um, it's weird. Duke guys don't seem to work out as well as we think they're going to work out in the end. Tatum's, Tatum's pretty good. Yeah, true. True. But I like Jaden Ivy a whole bunch. I will say this. 
if I had to bet money today, who's going to be the best player out of this draft five years from now? I think it's going to be Jaden Ivey. I could be wrong. Really? The situation dictates it, right? If he goes to Sacramento and he's there with um, the Baylor kid, Mitchell, he's there with Fox. I don't know how he gets the minutes to prove how great he is, but in the right situation, I think that Ivy uh, kid could really, really be great. And the game is going to so much. These guys that are six foot four to six foot seven are dominating the NBA. And he kind of fits that role for me. I don't know much about the Iowa kid. I need to watch the Iowa kid more. Who's going I haven't. To work this. I haven't done any homework on him because he's not, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't think he's on the Knicks radar as a trade up candidate. And he's obviously not, not falling into 11. I did. I actually, I watched the, the final um, four game between UNC and Duke today. Cause I was trying to do my homework on AJ Griffin and Paolo, he does pop off the screen. I, I, I think in the right situation with the right mentality, right aggressiveness, uh, he could be pretty special. Yeah. So I do think there's five guys in this draft and then it, it drops off into who knows. Cause obviously I'm biased because of Adrian Griffin, former Dallas Maverick and AJ, I, he's young. The thing about him is I don't think he'll ever be a star, but I think no. he's going to be not crazy Ron Artest meta world piece, but I could see him being like a meta world piece, Ron Artest guy because he's physical, he's defensive, yeah. but I don't think, I don't think he'll ever be a guy you want to not in the crazy way, but say that's our guy. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't see that for him either. I mean, I know he's young. I I wish I liked the way he moved on defense a little bit more because he. And again, maybe that's just he's young and he hasn't. Been I'll talking. say this: Adrian Griffin moved in a weird way too, but was a good defensive player, and his son's way more talented. So that kind of okay. I get what you're talking about because his dad he moves a little bit like his dad, and his dad was able to be effect, effective, uh, a very good defensive player. When you're like. He doesn't look fast, but nobody ever gets by him. So okay, all right, that's a, that's a I'll keep that one in mind, um, Mike. You, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much of a pleasure uh, it is for us to be able to to pick your brain on this stuff. Truly, an honor. Um, just remind the folks at home where they could uh, find you and and all your stuff. Thanks for having me. This is a blast. Please don't take Jalen Brunson uh, unless we get something great in return. You can find me on one hundred five three The Fan. In Dallas, it's on the Odyssey app is the app that, you know, we're owned by. Um, and then also I do pre and post for the Dallas Mavericks tonight. I do have a, a night off or sorry, Texas the Rangers. <laughs> I'd love to do Mavericks, but I do the Texas Rangers um, and they're playing the Houston Astros right now as we're recording this. I got the next series uh, that they have, I believe, against the Mariners. So I do that about 50 percent of the games. Have a blast doing that. They're better. Uh, then luckily their start, but I am let's go Mets. I do think they can win it all this year, but DeGrom and Scherzer and Bassett have to be healthy come playoff time. I'll settle for one out of three right now. (laughs) (laughs) If the Mets make it to the world series, you're going to attend uh, one of the games, Mike. Oh my God. That would be, that would be awesome. My boys right now are 14 and 12. I just took them to Texas A&M. One of them, who the other one was in camp and I couldn't take them, but we went to the college world series to watch them, the super regional to go to the world series. That was really fun. I think that they would have a blast because my 14 year old's favorite player is Francisco Lindor and my 12 year old's player fluctuates, but he has said at one point, in the last six months, Pete Alonzo is his favorite. Hey, right. So like literally in our household, we are Mets fans. And my son thinks it's really cool. He's like, you went from the Indians to the Mets and Lindor went from the Indians to the Mets. And I know they're called the Guardians. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'll always say I played for the Indians. I know they're the Guardians now. But um, yeah, so it's he. I'm like, yes, Francisco Lindor, a little bit different than dad. But yes, I did go from the Indians to the Mets. So. It'd be nice if you had gotten a similar uh, gift. Oh, pay, payday. payday. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it would have been, uh, man, with, it, it's, a, it's it. I'm not getting in. It's fun. Um, I wish I would have had more of a chance with the Mets. I also wish even to this day, I don't, I, I guess I take responsibility for how I pitched and how I played and I should have done better. Like, I'm like, dang it, man. I, I was better than, you know, there's a little bit of, it's, it's a whole nother podcast on how New York can kind of get to you. And now I was young. I was, I was 24, 23, 24 years old in New York. It is, 
it's tough and I wish I would have handled it better and took care of my responsibilities as a player rather than worrying about things that I couldn't control. I wish I would have been better for the Mets. I love playing for the Mets. And it probably would have been better if we were better as a Met because getting cussed at when you're like, well, I didn't do anything last night. I just watched the game like you guys watched the game. Yes, we sucked, but I can't say that out loud. So good, good to know. I'm sure some athletes wish we could, they could say we suck. Mike Bassett, you are the man. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs>